it's hard to speak words after the words we heard, honestly. But thank, thank you, Eric, thank you. for this. It was a privilege to have this piece here for the first time. And Bill and Tony and Gil, the three of you are amazing together. So thank you so much. Um, Eric, would you like to say anything before we we take questions, or should we just open things up? Uh, I think we could open okay. things up. <laughs> okay. Um, congratulations to Eric's parents. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, Thank you for coming. <laughs> Would you would you like the first question? Would one of you like the first question? You're you're completely entitled. <laughs> you were sitting right there. No. <laughs> yes. Uh, question for Gilbert. Mm -hmm. I was very taken by what you said about from not having a particular antecedent. So you know, I want you to disabuse me of a very subjective notion that I have where I am hearing a great consonance between Harry Parch and George Crumb. I, I won't try to develop that because I would really prefer to be disabused of it by you. I, I don't think I need the mic. Do I need the mic? No. Okay. Neither do you. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, maybe I was not speaking entirely formally. Uh, George Cum is very aware of the antecedents in his life, and he's even plays viola, in, or he played viola when he was younger in an amateur orchestra and sat in the back of the section. He loves the classics. Um, he thinks very little of himself he, compared to what he considers the great classics. Now, there were people who used the inside of the piano at the beginning of the century, like uh, Henry Cowell. Uh, so it's not that everything he does has no background. He didn't come into this world like without having heard a lot of music. So I think somebody like Parch, who invented his own instruments, uh, comes out of the same kind of Americana that uh, of inventing sounds and of making sounds that were in his imagination. I don't think that they're uh, opposed to one another. I just think they they went on a different path, but they both both used uh, either new instruments or new ways of using instruments or new sounds. There's no doubt about that. But I, I guess also, like, for Parch, there's nobody who's really followed in his steps. There's nobody that came before him, in a way. I mean, American music got a little experimental, basically in the teens, 19 teens, from Ives, Cowell, uh, Dane Rujar, uh, people like that. And then it, Copeland, presented a kind of Americana. And so uh, there was plenty of new, uh, new works going before the 20th century. There were no American composers that you could consider significant. American composers went to Europe. And they uh, learned from the masters. And like Ives was uh, basically considered illiterate and uh, at Yale, he, they very much disapproved of what he did because he did not follow the model. All the teachers there were from the great Germanic tradition and he went his own way. He was American. His father played in a band. It's like that. So the influence of our country and then the beginning of an American voice and Crum is following that voice. But there's nobody and that's not to say that people don't use the inside of the piano still, or use harmonics or plucking or whatever, but in the way he used it, there are no followers, really. And, and in the 70s, it's very interesting, he wrote a piece called Ancient Voices of Children, 
and it created a kind of positive riot when it was performed. And uh, many serial composers said, ah, he's just full of gimmicks. It's not real music. And yet, in the New York Times, the review of that piece was, George Crumb, the savior of no music. So, you know, it just, very many points of view. So many of the composers who were uh, fashionable in that day considered him an outsider, and that it was not serious music. He did not write serial music, either with the pitches or with the dynamics. He wrote from his, you know, from his hearing and from his uh, background. So I think parts too, of course. I think I've talked enough. Thank you. That was very generous. And Crumb was kind of doing his own thing in the time period where people were doing other, other things and. And he, of course, did reference the past in, in macrocosm of slow death music. He quotes Chopin, and, and so he's a lot of quoting. So he's, he's living in a tradition, but I think as we all are trying to say our own thing about it, but not, he's not following the trends of, of where music was going. In that piece, by the way, maybe you don't know that, maybe you do. Uh, he wanted to use Rachmaninoff's second I know. Yeah. concerto, but the copyright was not out. Yeah. So he used the Chopin, very, the uh, fantasy impromptu that's very well known. He wanted something you know, very, very familiar, but he wasn't allowed to use Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff was one of his favorites, and the, the early songs have all of that Rachmaninoff-like figuration in that's them, right. like from, from the A2 right. and things like that. So yeah, He's, uh, George knows more music, right, just like music and is referring to thinking about it all the time than almost anybody I know. Yeah, his piece, um, Love Death Music from Macrocosmos, which quotes the Chopin, originally wanting to quote the, the Rachmaninoff, has all these uses of major chords in the left hand that really struck me is, is like we, in that time period, people were not writing major chords. <laughs> and, and, and it actually influenced yeah. my piece, and you hear there so many major chords, especially around Higginson's themes, and came from both Ives and uh, Crumb's influence. Wow. That was a so good Eric, question. Is this a tour? Are there other cities where you're taking this? Yeah, we're, there's going to be a performance in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, in March. Uh, a different cast of performers. And uh, we, we may do this again with this cast uh, in the, after that sometime. Yeah, looking for gigs. <laughs> so far it was a one-off. So we spent the last three days all day working on all of this, came together, and it's, you know, it's kind of a privilege to do it and to be in one place all together with no other music to deal with and you get away from your everyday life in a way and it's both difficult and a privilege so, and we didn't of course we didn't know this piece at all and uh, yeah uh, jumping off on that tree you said you know you don't know this piece at all so how uh, this new piece, how did uh, all of you guys go into immersing yourself in the score and in uh, developing this performance that we just had? Singers always start with the text. And uh, ideally, if you have a little time to have the piece um, gestate, um, you you immerse yourself in that text before even looking at a single note. Because uh, our job as performers in some ways is to get inside the mind of the composer. And we have a composer here we can talk to, which is great. But even before doing that, I want to have some ideas myself about what Eric's relationship to that text was. And then, you know, you develop kind of your own reading of the text. And then when I go and see what notes and rhythms he's attached to that, then I get curious about, well, why? Why is he seeing it this way? Because any composition 
um, you know, any, any vocal setting, is a reading of the text in terms of the pacing, how you want to deliver the contour, you know, where, where the ideas strike the characters or what's just kind of a, a rumination on the way to another idea. And everybody's reading of that is going to be very personal. And so, and so then, I, then I feel like I'm having a, a kind of a three-way dialogue between this text, between Dickinson's poems, say, and, and, and the composer and myself. Um, and, and then I have options. Then I, then I have options. And then I have more questions. Um, and can start to kind of play with the with the material, the rhythmic material, and then then when you start to put it together with the ensemble, then there's a whole new set of questions that starts to arise um, because you find yourself bumping up against new material that you hadn't planned on before, and and so it's kind of like you get this nice little uh, crowd of of people having this great conversation. And you keep on adding one, and and you know. And sometimes things just get worked out in the doing of it. It's not that we're nitpicking about any of these questions. It's that there's now enough considered material starting to rub up against each other that we we can figure out how the puzzle fits together. It's a it's an amazing process. That the older I get with this, the more I realize relies as much on intuition as it does on the schooling and preparation. And I love the, the process of watching my brain knit together uh, the material that is, is mysterious to me. And all of a sudden the piece starts to reveal itself to me. And that is just like, it's the greatest, greatest thing. It's so much fun. <laughs> and then you wake up in a new place and you're like, oh, I, I see. And then you have more questions. So don't forget, in this situation, many of us have this situation in our lives often, the composer is present, but we also do works, for the most part, of people who are not alive. We can't ask them how they like this <laughs> or that. And we have to come to grips with it ourselves. And certainly, we don't play the way people played in the time of Beethoven or the time of Schumann or Debussy. And we have to make our own statement. We live in this century and we have to... And if the music is great enough, it will live in very many different ways. So here we had Eric to tell us, well, it's a little too slow, or uh, this should be, you know, more seco, this should be drier. Here, you can, here you're not loud enough, you know, things like that, that we basically always have to discover anyway. That's our life. And uh, pianists particularly have lots of notes. And so there's a lot of practicing. I think uh, Tony is extremely fast, and I'm not. And so there are a lot of notes to learn, so you better be prepared well before you know, to look at things so you get an idea, so you come not, you know, incapable of interacting <coughs> with the music, with your colleagues. I think that all musicians and singers have an impulse to just start practicing, to open the score and say, okay, let me just start trying to do it. And uh, it, I don't have to tell you guys, but it's really important to stop and, and ask yourself first, what's there? What's on the page? Because there's a lot, and I think in Eric's piece, there's a lot on the page. It's pretty detailed. You know, there's a fair amount of fairly free declamation in the, in the, vocal, parts, in the vocal parts, but the rhythms are notated quite precisely. There are lots of tempo indications. There are lots of dynamic indications. And those are the things that frequently, if we just start learning it, you know, pay attention to everything, everything that's on the page. And I, I, Tony's act, absolutely right. The first thing you do is, is to read the text, and, and then, and then we, we have to go backwards, you know, because the composer reads the text, and then he goes this way. We read the text, and then we go that way. 
And so it's a very different, it's a very different process. But uh, again, as everybody is saying, fascinating process. Before we take one last question, I just also wanted to comment my own, this is the second time I've heard, heard the piece, and I find the simplicity of the instrumentation that you chose to just use a piano, um, and sometimes very spare, sometimes not, but very often just the ringing of one note, um, to be a beautiful mirror of the words that you said. So I feel a lot of people would want to throw color into it, and you found so much color, um, of course through guilt, someone was playing it, <laughs> in, in that simplicity, I thought. So that was actually part of what touched me so deeply about the piece, most times I've heard it. So. Any last, last question? If I may. Yes, please. Um, between all sounds ceased and there came wind like a bugle, I was just wondering if uh, you would be willing to share some of what you were thinking about in the contrast of the way characters were exploring this idea, or because so often they're in different places and they haven't met yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, for here, particularly in There Came Wind Like a Bugle, with the music, I thought it was a little more vague. Uh, just on first listening mm -hmm. for me, um, from what Emily was observing or stating. Yes, yeah, so I guess in the earlier parts of the piece, there is a very direct kind of dialogue going on. Dickinson is writing uh, letters and getting responses and and we see kind of her progression and, and I was thinking as we move on in the, the war there's kind of two themes that are and ideas that are kind of rising above kind of tangentially ac across the, the drama that's happening. The drama is now the war but seeing that she wrote the bulk of, of her poetry during the Civil War that are that's like some of the, the most famous poems and this was one of them and I think thought here she's commenting from afar and perhaps not even to him but to us and uh, what it feels like to be living during the Civil War in Amherst, Massachusetts um, and what, what, how her words uh, echo perhaps what Higginson and the soldiers are feeling there. So she's kind of commenting from afar but I guess starting to show maybe how her words are becoming more universally applicable and at the end my words are laid in, way in books. She's, we're, I, we really kind of, like if it was a film, we've really zoomed out from the whole world and we're, we're watching the, the end of it from afar and from the present, perhaps. And we're no longer in the present of the, the present today, not the present of the, the past of the piece. Yeah, I think that, that's a very interesting example. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's uh, perhaps a unique place where Higginson and and Dickinson are not corresponding at that point. They're speaking, they're speaking to other people. You know, she's speaking to her readers, whoever they might be. But she's not necessarily. I don't think uh, we're not supposed to think that that poem is going. Higginson's not reading that poem, and neither is he telling her in that description of that battle, that night in the woods in which they end up winning. But we find out later, with great loss of, of life and carnage, he's not telling her that. You know, and I think that's an interesting spot. It's an interesting observation. And it's actually two poems that have been put together. The, the, the came a wind like a bugle. Is we only have the first few lines, and Copeland set the rest of it. So this is now cut, and then we get the the second po poem, just uh, kind of placed in there. So it, it is. It's not a, a direct saying, this is this poem, but using her words to, for us and for Mark Campbell, the librettist who worked with me to adapt this, to say something beyond her words, using her words to make a, a point about things. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I, well, one more question, because it's your mom. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think hearing the first pieces in the um, Whitman poem, the bugle, that first bugle poem, the drama and the bugle, 
made what you're saying in the second, in, in Aaron's piece, so much more meaningful because we've already been thinking about, you know, people just dying, you know, and, and you know, the, the horror of that war. Right. So she she knew that. She, you know, because those Massachusetts boys went down there and they, they didn't come back. So she was aware of that. Seth so. makes pretty good program. Yeah. That, that you programmed that to, to, to prep us. But that's what this was all going to be. The program is a composition in itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah really. Very, it's the easiest part, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, and thank Eric and the three of you. It's such a wonderful wow. evening for all of us.